Hello and warmly welcome to Christ Church Without Walls on Sunday, August the 30th. This is our 24th service since we started doing church online. Isn't that amazing? According to YouTube, there are usually between 60 and 80 people or households watching our services live. And then within a few days, that can go up to almost 200 views. In addition, there's been a steady stream of DVDs being delivered to people who can't access YouTube. Thank you to Stephen for doing that. The theme of our service today is Love in Action. And we will be hearing from Simon later in the service as he unpacks part of chapter 12 of Paul's letter to the Romans. Last week, Sarah and Charlie helped us to think about being living sacrifices. And this next part of Romans chapter 12 gives us practical advice on how to live and love sacrificially. Our first song today is a lovely demonstration of how to live lives of love in action.
we come from scattered lives to meet with God. Let us recognise his presence with us. As God's people we have gathered, let us worship him together. Faithful one, whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise, inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pause for a moment as we prepare to receive God's forgiveness. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world and knows our every word and deed. Let us then open ourselves to the Lord and confess our sins in penitence and faith. We are sorry for the times when we do not show your love to others, but think only of ourselves. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We are sorry for not looking after your beautiful world, but just using it for our own ends. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We are sorry when our behaviour is a stumbling block to others, and we forget we are about your business. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I would like to hand over to Anna, who has something to say to the children. Hello. When I was a teenager, you could get a lot of cards in card shops, which had a little heading saying, love is, and then it would show a picture of a cute little couple, and it would say, love is something like never leaving her behind on a walk or love is knowing when enough is enough, or love is holding on to every precious memory, um, and various other little phrases like that. And there'd always be this sweet little couple gazing at each other adoringly. Now, I wonder, because I haven't seen those cards for a long time, so I was just wondering if maybe we could think of a few things that we think love is. So, I wonder, we've just come out of summer holidays, haven't we? I wonder whether maybe one thing we could say love is, is maybe love is going on a sailing boat. Going on a sailing boat with your family, perhaps. Maybe you've done that this summer. Or maybe, hmm, maybe love is asking somebody to marry you and getting a house together and setting up home. Maybe that's what love is. Or, hmm, how about, oh, here's a good one. How about maybe love is letting somebody eat a whole big corner off your bar of chocolate. Um, maybe in this time of a lot of social distancing, which is quite hard, isn't it? Maybe love is getting on a train and going to visit Granny, perhaps, who you haven't seen for a long time. And going to visit a friend or a relation who may be a bit lonely. Lots of definitions about what love is. But do you know what? I think that if we want to know what real love is, the Bible points us to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Well, if we look at one of our readings today, Jesus says, if you want to learn from me, 
if you want to live like me, if you want to love like me, then what you have to do is this. Take up your cross every day and follow me. And the Bible says that is what true love is. Now, what does taking up your cross mean, actually, every day for us? Well, for Jesus, it actually really did mean going to the cross. It meant that he, di he died for us. He loved us so much that he died. And when he died, he took the punishment for all the things we've done wrong so that we could be friends with God again. For us, taking up our cross is probably not going to mean dying, but it might mean something which the Bible calls dying to ourselves, saying that actually we're no longer the most important thing in our lives, but God is, and other people perhaps before ourselves. So what would that look like? Well, it might look like something, um, for instance, forgiving somebody when they've done something horrible to you, when you know that you were in the right. It might look like helping someone when they ask you to help, even though actually you'd really rather do something else at that point. It might look like going to that person who doesn't seem to ever have any friends at school and saying that you'll play with her. I don't know what it looks like for you. I know that it's not always easy. Picking up a cross and following Jesus isn't always easy, but it is amazing. And I think you'll find that as you do it. And God is always there to help us. And that's the good thing to know. The reading today is from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21. Love in action. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The theme of our service this week is love in action. I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of love in action over the last few months, as I have witnessed people going out of their way to be kind to their friends and neighbours in this time of lockdown. As a real life, live example of love in action, I would like to invite Sarah to tell us a bit about the COVID-19 support group that she and Tina set up at the beginning of lockdown. I had a short chat with Sarah about what they've been doing, which I would like to share with you now. Hello, Sarah, and welcome. Thank you. 
So how has COVID-19 outreach been helping people during lockdown? So there are already a lot of um, support networks at Christchurch, um, pastoral groups, home groups, and so on, um, friendship club, um, but obviously um, COVID-19 presented us with a completely different set of issues. Um, particularly, I was concerned um, about the practical implications for people um, in terms of, of getting groceries and prescriptions and things like that. Um, people who were forced to lock down at the beginning of, um, of, of April, end of March, um, particularly older people, more vulnerable people, um, people who had to shield. Um, so um, I suggested to the church wardens that perhaps we might want to um, organise something particularly for this. Um, they um, pointed me in the direction of Tina Benny um, and since then we've been working as a team. Um, we've managed to gather about 25 um, volunteers to help, um, mainly on an ad hoc basis. Um, but um, um, we, we've, what we've actually found um, is that we haven't had a huge number of requests for practical help. We've had some, we've had a few shopping runs, um, we've had um, uh, some, some, some sort of missed shopping items, things like that, a few prescriptions. And I know that there's some individuals that have been doing well, that sort of thing routinely for people in the, in the congregation, um, sort of independently from this or perhaps started from this and then carried on doing it. Um, but the, the main um, feedback that we've had is, it, is it's knowing that the safety net is there. Um, so, it, and, uh, and the, we've, we've been keeping people updated with a monthly news sheet as well and reiterating that, that we are here, all of us, um, all of the volunteers, if, if people feel they need a, a phone call or some practical assistance. Thank you, that sounds really good. Um, and I'm sure people have been really appreciating it. So how have you seen God working in people's lives? So what was quite touching at the beginning of the process um, is the number of people from outside the church community as well who came forward to Christ Church, um, who, who had never come to the church before, um, but thought, I wonder if I can help through Christ Church. Um, and that, that, was, that was very heartwarming, really, um, to know that people recognised us as a, as a sort of hub. Um, so um, I, it, we've had a few um, volunteers, there's a couple um, not far from the church who have who've done a few shopping runs for us um, and I remember a phone call with one of the recipients um, at the time and I said to her the lovely thing about it is is that um, these people don't even attend Christchurch and she said oh doesn't God work in mysterious ways <laughs> um, and she was she was very very touched by that um, and I think um, that's probably been um, one of the things about COVID-19 is, is that it has moved people um, towards actions which are very much in the Christian spirit. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's changed people's mentalities, I think, quite a lot. Um, and I say they've acted more in, in line with our, our traditional Christian values. Thank you. I was going to ask you what people's responses have been, but you've given me already um, uh, that lovely response there. Have you got any other examples of people's responses? Yeah, so um, at the beginning, in order to um, raise awareness of the group, um, we sent out about 60 Easter cards to people that we'd identified that might need support. And um, it was overwhelming because I've, I've worked in sales and marketing for years. And, and you, you normally, you measure your conversion rate or your response rate on things. And obviously we weren't even asking people to come back to us to, to recognize or acknowledge this communication. But we had about, about five or 10 people come back, just, just phone us and say, they phone, more people phone Tina, I think, she's much better known than I am as well, they, to phone up and say, thank you so much for this. There was one um, gentleman that phoned me and said, it's just such a beautiful, because we sent, we sent some postcards of Christchurch. Well, it's so lovely to see a photograph of Christchurch. And um, it, it was a beautiful moment. Um, I was watching the, um, the online service on Easter Day. And um, as soon as the service finished, um, a lovely lady phoned me and said, thank you so much for the Easter card. It meant so much to me. Um, and that, it's just, it was just beautiful. Um, mm. and, it's, and, it, and it showed how much it was appreciated. And I, and I know that some people have also um, 
sort of said, oh, I haven't received a newsletter. You know what I mean? So it's something that, that people have, 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 have liked that, you know, that they, that they um, enjoy. And so that's another thing I wanted to say. If there's anybody who's watching this who thinks, actually, I'd quite like to be kept in touch with like that, then, then please let us know because um, we'd yep. be happy to get you to the list. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And yes, you can find um, um, links to the COVID-19 outreach group in the um, uh, notice sheet that always comes with the email that Anna sends out. So little um, plug for that. Um, so Sarah, are there any um, other um, highlights that you would like to share with us about COVID-19 outreach and your love in action? Um. I think it's really it's it's been something that's brought the whole church together um, and um, I was speaking with Tina about this yesterday uh, it's something that we agreed on that um, it's it's really it's really shown even though the support hasn't always been needed the practical support um, it's been a, a, a brilliant and beautiful demonstration of, um, of, of, of the love within Christchurch um, and how, how we are keen to reach out in times of need um but yeah it's, it's very significant i think um so yeah it's it's been um it's been been really um really exciting yeah lovely thank you so much sarah um i just while i'm here I'd like to share one of my personal highlights uh from lockdown um stephen has been producing dvds of our services for people who don't have any access to the internet um and so they can watch the services and as a result, we've heard from three members of our Christchurch Without Walls congregation who we'd actually never met before, who've really appreciated getting the DVDs and who have expressed their gratitude. So that was a highlight for me and shows that as actually in this time of lockdown, we are reaching people that we haven't reached before and they are benefiting. So, um, yeah, that's fab, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'll say goodbye now and uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The reading is from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. Jesus predicts his death. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I wonder if you've ever thought about what a church looks like. Ask someone to draw a church, they might well sketch something similar to the building that we worship in here. The line drawing that has been used for a couple of the pre-service adverts. There's a big church bit where there are pews or chairs. There's a, a large tower where bells are rung or, or not, depending on which building you're in. There are stained glass windows. It's a church. If you were asked to describe a church, 
you might well use some of those words that describe those things as well. Pews, tower, stained glass window. Another, and I would suggest a better alternative, might be to take the reading from Paul's letter to the Romans and say, this is what a church looks like, or at least it should. Paul is writing to a group of Christians, the church in Rome, in preparation for visiting them. As yet, he doesn't know much about them, except what he's been told, and in turn, the readers of this letter don't know a great deal about Paul. This is a letter of introduction and explains what Paul believes and why. The main subject is faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation comes to us not through what we do, but from whom we put our trust in. It is God's forgiveness that rescues us and not our own efforts. It would not be unfair to call this letter Paul's Gospel. It is his explanation of the good news of Jesus Christ, the very definition of gospel. And in this short passage, in the second half of chapter 12, Paul gives us a challenging but inspiring list of things that Christians should aspire to. These are simple things, all of which express our love for God and reflect the great love that he has shown us. And the list is summed up in the final verse we heard. This is verse 21 again. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, if that's the summing up, then what are the specifics? That great favourites of wedding couples, 1 Corinthians 13, also penned by Paul, has an echo in this passage. After all, it's all about love. For those that have forgotten it, here's a reminder. And for our purposes, verses 4 to 7 of 1 Corinthians 13 are, are the important bits. That's where Paul writes, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonour others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Well, I wonder if you've noticed the similarities. I'm reminded very much of a story about a family gathered around the Sunday lunch table discussing the morning sermon in church. I don't know how often those discussions take place around your lunch table, but I'm, I'm sure they must happen somewhere. Anyway, the daughter of the family pipes up and says, that preacher, it's the same every week. Blah, 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 love. Blah, 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 love. Well, actually, I think I'd be kind of happy to be accused of that. And to a, to a degree, I think the same can be said about some of what Paul has to say. In that Corinthians reading, Paul lists the things that love is not and doesn't do. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, dishonour, it doesn't get angry, it doesn't delight in evil. It isn't proud, it isn't self-seeking. But these are sandwiched in between the things that love is and what it does do. Love is patient and kind. It rejoices in the truth. It protects. It hopes. It trusts. It perseveres. And then in our Romans passage, Paul opens with love being sincere. The New Century version of the Bible puts it like this. Your love must be real. There is nothing pretend, there's nothing fake about it. This love is, to borrow a phrase from Coca-Cola, 
the real thing. Paul's Corinthians list in 1 Corinthians 13 is a handy list to have in our hands as we move on in this bit of scripture, this, this bit of uh, Romans that we're reading this morning. It's how the 1 Corinthians theory is put into practice in Romans. Hate what is evil. Do what is good, writes Paul. Being told to hate something does great a little, to my mind at least. But the important thing here is being told to hate is that the way we treat evil is with contempt. We deliberately avoid it. I'm reminded very much of the confessional prayer that, where we say sorry to God for our sins of omission. Those times we haven't done the things that we should. And that is the hating of evil. Don't ignore it. Actively work against it. And use good. Use good as the weapon to defeat evil. In so many situations in our world currently, there are a great many places where these words of Paul can be applied. And boy, would they make a huge difference. Although the news cycle is now very much, and quite rightly, focused on the coronavirus, a while back, you may remember, you may have seen uh, the events that took place in Charlottesville in the United States. There were rallies near riots and the death of a protester rallying against the far right, who themselves were protesting about the removal of a statue. What only some of the news outlets picked up on was hundreds of clergy who had gathered to stand in opposition to the rallying call of the far right. This was not standing idly by and watching the violence unfold and maybe having a strong word against it. This was responding to evil with love. Well, Paul's next plea is that his readers should be devoted to one another in love, honouring one another above ourselves. God first, others next, ourselves last. That's the mantra. Never be lacking in zeal. He says, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. And among the busyness of modern life, how do you keep your spiritual fervour? And a better question might well be, what is spiritual fervour? Well, I'm not sure that's turning every conversation to God. I think Paul actually gives us some really good guidance as to what spiritual fervour might look like in his very next sentence. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be faithful in prayer. And approaching those three things in the reverse order, I think, works best as a guide to spiritual fervour. Faithful in prayer. Prayer is the first option, not the last. I heard a wonderful answer phone message recently on the number of a clergy friend of mine who lives in Suffolk. For the sake of anonymity, let's call him the Reverend John Smith. And we'll refer to his church as All Saints Suffolk. And the message on his phone went something like this. You've read, you've rung the office of the Reverend John Smith of All Saints Suffolk. I'm sorry. I can't take your call as I'm away from the office. In the absence of the area dean, please contact the archdeacon. If they aren't available, then the Bishop of St Edmundsbury and Ipswich should be your next call. If he is away, the Archbishop of Canterbury can be contacted on 020-7898-1200. And if none of the above are available, then I would suggest praying. It did make me giggle, but it also sums up what our attitude to prayer so often is. It's the last thing we try if all other options come to nothing, which 
is less spiritual fervour and more spiritual desperation. So pray first. Be patient in whatever circumstances you're praying about and be joyful. Which is, I am the first to admit, easier said than done. But it'll be much more attainable if prayer has been the place you've started. Paul goes on, share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Back to the United States again. I saw a picture a while ago that had been taken in Houston following some dreadful flooding. It was an image of people queuing. Now, as a Brit, I like to think I have an intimate knowledge of queuing. The queue we saw was long, it was winding, but it wasn't a queue for a food bank. It wasn't people waiting for aid or for accommodation. It was people who were queuing up to volunteer. A queue of people wanting to help others who had lost so much. And again, that's what it should be about for us. This is about helping all of God's creation that's in need. And being hospitable isn't just about welcoming people into your own home, but it might well be that as well. It's about welcoming people into the house of God. It's about welcoming newcomers into a community. It's about showing the love of God to all. Well, there is so much more in this passage. The time we have this morning isn't enough to go into detail in all of it. Paul says some great things. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Like so much of the book of Romans, we could spend an enormous amount of time just looking at these few verses, those ones I've just spoken of. Can I suggest that if you have a few moments, open up a Bible, have a read through it yourself, see what jumps out at you. Why don't you send me an email or a message on Facebook and tell me about that afterwards. But for now, we're just going to end with the final verse that we heard. Verse 12, it finishes off the section which started in verse 9, where Paul had begun with this, love must be sincere, the real thing. And then hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And then he ends with this. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the take home this morning. In a world where evil is so often prevalent, it is our reacting with God's goodness to that evil that will change our community, it will change our nation, and it will change our world.
let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God of love and that you love us so much that you sent your precious and perfect Son to die for us. Help us to love, and help us to love in ways which are practical and caring. We give thanks for all the kindness and goodwill which has been shown during this pandemic, and pray that the weakest and most vulnerable amongst us would feel supported and loved. Please prompt us if there is something particular you would like us to do, which would bring a blessing to someone else. Help us to be your hands, your feet and your lips as we seek to serve you in all that we do. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. This week we pray for children and their teachers as they return to school, particularly after such a long absence. Help them to settle back into the routine of school life and help them to make up for time away from the classroom. We particularly pray for children who have not been able to study at home and find they are far behind their peer group. We pray that schools would be sensitive to their needs and find ways of helping them. We pray for young people as they look forward to starting university or embarking on other forms of learning, such as apprenticeships. We pray for those who are unable to take up a place this year and pray that they would be helped in finding the right course of study next year. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for the continued management of this pandemic so that infection numbers would fall and that those who do become ill would receive the best possible treatment. We pray for an effective vaccine to be found as soon as possible and pray that it will be widely available. We give thanks for our NHS and all essential workers who have worked so tirelessly. However, we acknowledge that there are parts of the world which are not so well supported and which lack even basic facilities. We pray for the pandemic to be contained in these places. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for those for whom lockdown has been particularly hard, thinking of the lonely and victims of domestic abuse. For some, it's led to alcoholism or increasing levels of anxiety and depression. We pray also for anyone who has lost or fears losing their job and for business owners facing collapse. We pray also for the sick, remembering all those listed on our notice sheet and any others known to us personally. We pray for people awaiting treatment, that resources can be made available to enable them to receive it. We pray too for the family and friends of Steve Osmond and Gift Tarara. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the Collect for the Twelfth Sunday after Trinity. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, Remind us of your goodness, increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
If you haven't ever joined us in our virtual Harwood Hall Zoom rooms after the service, I do encourage you to join us, even if just for a few minutes. You can find the link to the Zoom meetings in the email that Anna sent out. Click on the link and you will find a document with a choice of hosts. Double click on the one of your choice and, and find some friends to continue fellowship with. I look forward to seeing you. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he make himself known to you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with us all now and forevermore. Amen.